So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jessica. I currently work for the Legal Aid Agency with the Ministry of Justice. Um, when Jason kindly asked me to come and talk here, I had started as a lead developer and I've since become a technical architect because apparently I change job title every six months. Um, all of the things I'm talking about today aren't necessarily related to my job. It's things I've gained through experience. I also have an excellent partner who has a lot of experience being a manager and I've learned a lot from him as well. So Morton Broccoli, a lot of uh, this has been stolen from some of his resources over time and just people I've met along the way as well. Today, I'm going to talk not only about technical leadership, but also people management and how both of them kind of link into each other in terms of the methodologies. So my journey so far, um, in terms of leadership, I've kind of drip fed myself slowly into it. So from the very start, I've done some talks, I've done some blogging uh, that's been at conferences, meetups, just my personal blog, trying to get into the habit of knowledge sharing and being comfortable with learning about something and then speaking about it and trying to teach others about it because I find that reaffirms what I've learned. I've also taken part in quite a bit of mentoring, both inside and outside of work. This has been technical mentoring and it has been a personal mentorship as well. I can't really avoid it because it's going to be part of this, but as a woman in tech, you do get approached for mentorship because people see you and go, hey, you're like me. I want a little bit of guidance based on that. I've also done coaching and sponsorship. I'm going to go into the difference between mentoring, coaching and sponsorship as part of this talk. In terms of work as a developer, a lot of it was pairing and trying to gain and share knowledge through those means. Uh, I then went on to run two teams, uh, two technical teams, mostly backend, some infrastructure, uh, which taught me a lot. And that was more technical leadership. I hadn't taken part in uh, people management at that point. I then got my job as a lead developer, which involved both leading technical direction and doing people management, which is where I've started to write, put this talk together and the content of it and realize the overlap between the two and how they really help each other. And I'm now a technical architect, but I still do my people management duties, uh, which I actually think helps me in my role. And I'll go a little bit into that as well. So this is where it all goes wrong very quickly. I want to run a couple of polls. So um, if you can see the website at the top, mentimeter.com, uh, and then plug in that code, hopefully you should be able to enter uh, three words. And what I'd like you to do is think about a good leader or an example of good leadership and what qualities they had that you can think of. Great, so we've got a lot of themes coming up around communication, encouragement, listening, being humble and patient, being accountable, being respectful. In general, good human behaviors by a lot of it. Uh, feedback, which we'll also be going into. Uh, being available. A lot of very common themes there, which is great because it actually goes well into what I'm going to be talking about. This could have gone terribly wrong. Being calm, being honest, skilled. Okay, so what I'm getting from this is... Um, Actually, we'll do the second poll first and then I'll see if it's lining up to what I'm expecting. So this is the opposite. Think of somebody you've had who you thought wasn't the best manager in the world, wasn't the best leader in the world, and what behaviours made them particularly counterproductive? Being absent, having a temper, being vague. Self-centred authoritarian, close-minded, arrogant, selfish. <laughs> it looks like a lot of you have had more bad managers than you've had good ones and bad leaders than you've had good ones based on uh, how quickly these are coming in. Bias, deceptive. I'm so sorry you've had some of these experiences. Close-minded, playing politics. This has worked out for me. I wasn't sure if it would. Um, 
So when we think about different types of leaders, I tend to think of politicians or uh, people we know and respect within the tech community, and they have certain character characteristics. And what I've found so far in my career is a lot of people don't like this dictator ivory tower, I know best, very closed minded form of leader. Uh, I don't know why, but like Putin comes to mind in my brain. There's a lot of them out there. And then the things that we really enjoy from leadership, whether it's technical, whether it's personal, is this openness, this honestness, this being able to reach out, being able to listen, which is a skill set which isn't often trained. Thank you for that. I will share these afterwards as well. I'm really glad that worked out because I wasn't sure what's going to come up in those three themes. So as I say, there's different forms of leader. Um, a lot of what I will talk about is often referred to servants leadership, which is uh, doing what's needed to enable your teams and able to help them help themselves to a large degree. I mentioned the difference between mentoring, coaching and sponsorship. So I'll quickly go through these because it's quite important. They often get mi uh, mixed up and mingled. The definitions aren't necessarily clearly defined, but this is how I see them. With mentoring, there's a very certain dynamic. Often a mentee goes to a mentor because they have experience that they're wanting to gain from, or they have some sort of quality that they're wanting themselves. So there's a bit of a power play here in that the mentor has a greater degree of power than the mentee. They normally have more experience in a certain thing, um, which is why as part of this, trust is very important because of the characteristics that we've just shown. You don't want a mentor that's going to turn around and say, you must do as I do because I am great. They need to be a bit, a little bit flexible in that different things are going to work for different people. Yes, it has worked in your experience. Share your experience. But know that it might not necessarily work for your mentee. And likewise, you don't want a fear-based relationship with mentorship. Probably don't want a fear-based relationship in any of these. Uh, the... Formats of your conversations can be very structured uh, and very action-based. So going through what the mentee is doing, uh, trying to see where they want to get to or what knowledge they want to gain from you and coming up with some sort of plan on what they should do next in order to achieve the next set of goals. It can be incredibly formulaic and that's not a bad thing. What I often find is I will start off with a mentee mentorship relationship and progress on to coaching. Coaching is formulaic, but in a different way. Instead of telling somebody what they could do, what they should do in order to get to a place, you're teaching your uh, mentee, I'm going to keep using that word, to introspect and get there themselves. There's a lot of um, training you can do in terms of coaching, and I'm going to go through a few of those in this talk. But for a coach, you want to ask questions to help guide the person you're talking to so that they can identify where they might be making mistakes, what they might want to do next, if the direction they're heading is the right direction for them. Again, trust is super important because that person is putting trust in you that you're going to help guide them in the right direction and ask the right questions. And also that you're going to be quite discreet about some of the things they're sharing, because often it can be quite personal even if you're just doing technical coaching. It can be personal in terms of how they learn, any difficulties they're having, impacts outside of work that might be affecting how they're learning as well. And sponsorship is the easiest of the three. Um, I do a lot of this, particularly with speaking, um, but I have done it in terms of technical projects as well. Sponsoring is that step further where you have worked with a person to get them to a stage where they're pretty good at what they're doing, but they just need the opportunity. So for work basis, if it's technical, say that they've been learning about security principles for a while. Uh, as a tech architect, I've got a security project happening. I will turn around to the person who's running it and say, hey, can I give the reins to this person? I'll support them where they need it, but let's give them an opportunity to lead this project and show us what they've learned. In terms of speaking, I will get invited to a meetup or a conference and occasionally I'll go, 
maybe not me. How about this person? They need the opportunity to do their very first talk and they're great. And I've been supporting them through it. So it's being able to lower that barrier so that people can do what you've been leading them and training them to do. As I say, these are related. Uh, I tend to find that men mentorship leads into coaching, leads into sponsorship. I now have people I coach who I started mentoring about six years ago, and we still have this coaching sponsoring relationship. Um, to be honest, they don't need me anymore, but I still enjoy having these conversations and helping where I can. That's the beauty of coaching as well, is whereas with mentoring, you are the authority in that subject. Often with coaching, they will go past you and excel past what your knowledge base is. And that's not a bad thing as long as you can help keep guiding them, keep them, helping them introspect. You might end up learning from them too. So they do get melded together. You often see that you're doing them in combination. But I just wanted clarity around each of these terms. And how these are related to management. Manage, being a manager can incorporate elements of all three of these things. It really depends on where your report is at. It, uh, it will differ very much between, say you're in development, whether you're looking after a junior developer who will need much more structured guidance compared to someone who's getting to that stage in their career where they're looking at, do I want to be a lead, a senior, a TA? How do I get to these different routes? What's right for me? Uh, what specialities do I want to look into? Should I get more into security, for example? So depending on what stage they're at in their career and how long you've been looking after them even, it can change on whether you're doing mentorship, coaching or sponsoring. With management as well, you will have some element which relates into business need. So uh, <laughs> you're going to be doing things like holiday and all of the admin work, but also trying to find out where's best fit for this person in terms of teams, in terms of the projects that are going on, uh, and how to best enable those projects. The thing to be careful about, because you're a manager, you might not necessarily just be looking at the tech part of leadership. You'll be looking after their personal and well-being as well. Be very, very careful not to end up as a therapist. Therapy is a profession for a reason. It's a very dangerous ground to step into if you're not trained. So I would suggest if you haven't had training on how to spot areas of anxiety, stress, depression, and when to point them towards more professional help. Definitely get some guidance on that because you can end up in some very sticky situations which aren't helpful for you or for the person you're looking after. People and technical leadership. I was originally going to do this centered entirely around technical leadership, but I'm now finding as I'm going through my role, these are inherently interlinked. Tech is very much led by people. Even if it's a maintenance change or something to ensure the stability of your system, the reason you're really doing it is your user at the end of the day. If it's making sure that the system's more stable for them, protecting their data, making sure things are more performant, it's always kind of relates back to that user experience. And likewise, with your team structures and team health, that will have greatly affect the tech that you're choosing and the tech that you're going with. So <laughs> I've tried to separate the two, but the more and more I get into my job as an architect, the more I'm finding my tech choices are influenced by the people who are using the system and the people who are making it. So I find that leadership uh, methodologies and techniques work for both sets of my, both skill sets of my current job. And both have business concerns. You want healthy teams with people who've got great well-being and feel like they're progressing and they're growing in their roles and they're not getting bored, uh, which is where a lot of my people management stuff comes in. And as I said, the tech is inherently related to people as well, and you want your tech to be working as well for your user as possible. So they are naturally intertwined from my point of view. I've waffled on a lot about my view on leadership. So I'm going to go through some actual methods in which you can read up on and use. This has been an interesting one for me over the last two, three years um, in terms of the different methodologies of leadership. I've studied this in terms of going on courses, reading books, talking to other managers, uh, but also from experience. And 
naturally as a senior dev, I found it was a lot easier to influence uh, particularly technical direction because I could lead by example. I could pair, I could do PRs in a way that I thought was the most correct for uh, our teams and our systems. I could document everything I was doing and try and get other people to work in the same way as I was because I could show here's the advantages of working this way. As I became a lead, I couldn't do that anymore. I was looking after so many teams that I couldn't be involved in their day to day. So I had to find other ways of winning hearts and minds, so to speak, and different ways of leading them while gaining trust in the ability and the direction that the teams were going. Scientific methods are going to further, but from my experience, having evidence-based conclusions is always useful. Just holding up your hands and going, we'll try this thing. If it doesn't work, it's fine. We can change it and we can do it differently. Let's try this thing. This is the result we expect and we'll see if it works. And often it does because I've normally done it before. That's the secret to this key. Gaining trust is essential, whether it's trust in your ability, whether it's trust in you as a person, probably both. You're not going to be able to um, lead certain direction without your teams having some sort of faith in you. Faith does not mean that you're always right. And again, I'll go into this further. I'm removing silos. As a leader, don't be the person who is doing everything uh, because as soon as you go off on holiday, everything collapses. Again, I've learned the hard way. So in terms of actual methodologies, uh, situational leadership, there is a link at the bottom and I will share all of the links after this talk, is uh, quite a commonly documented theory around how to do leadership. What it's saying is it really depends on the team, the person, whoever is being led and their scenario, their situation. So in some cases, teams and people will need more of a directive approach, much like we talked with mentorship, something very structured, do X to achieve Y. Where on the other end of the quadrant, you've got those who need less direction in terms of being very direct, but just need to be given the freedom and slight nudges to help them, again, introspect to go on the correct path again. Uh, there's also the levels of support, so how much you're engaged. Are you checking up on them on a daily basis with a stand-up going, have you done this thing? Or is it more of a case of letting them go with a piece of work and catching up as and when, knowing that they've you've got the trust in them to continue as they're going? Different teams, different people need different types of leadership. Um, I would go into this more, but it's actually probably better to read through uh, the PDF that I've got attached because it goes into great detail on how to spot which types of teams and people need which sort of leadership and how to identify that. In all honesty, that's probably a talk in itself. Uh, GROW is a very common coaching method, and it's one that I fall back on quite a lot. It's very similar to another one, which is called OSCAR, but I find GROW a lot easier to remember. Um, when you're in the first stages of coaching, this can be very useful as a structure to have the conversation with your person who you're supporting. And this, again, can be personal or can be technical. So get them to identify their goals. That first one is really easy to say and really hard to do sometimes. You'll find that their goal is so vague that you have to narrow it down into what they actually want to achieve. Um, so, for example, I had talked to someone the other day there who went, I want my teams to succeed. And we had to kind of go into the questions to find out what success meant for that person and make a goal around that. And that's why we refer to SMART goals here. And this is where I get the acronym wrong because I haven't put it in my speaker notes. So we'll see how this goes. But they need to be timely. So within a certain time scale, need to be realistic need to be actionable, so have things that you can do in order to achieve it. They need to be measurable, specific. But yeah, it needs to be specific uh, in terms of what they are trying to achieve. 
So we tried to get them to talk about it in that format. A, it will help narrow down and uh, get them focused on what their goal is, but also it will start to become more realistic from what I find uh, in terms of being able to do it, which then brings us on to reality. How realistic is it that they're going to achieve this goal? Are there any blockers? Are there any dependencies? What can we do to get around those? Then you go into options. Again, going back to what you've been putting in your charts about good leadership and bad leadership. This isn't turning around to someone and saying, your options are X, Y, Z. Instead, it's helping them identify the different ways in which they can go. And you can give suggestions, um, but in a format where they know that they can say if it's not right for them or if they have any worries about it. But in general, it's best to get the team, the person to say what their options are, weigh up the pros and cons openly, say about any risks. Um, and it'll get their own investment in it as well. If it's coming from the team, from the person, they'll be much more invested in trying to achieve this thing that's going to help them reach their goal. And the last one is will. There's a few different things you can do here. Uh, the very first one is to set out those actions. So you have your options. What's the first step to do that thing? What do you need to do then? And trying to progress, trying to build up this plan for how they're going to eventually achieve that goal. The other thing I like to do is when they've said that first action, let's go, okay, scale of one to five, how likely is it that you're going to do it in the next X time frame? And if they're kind of hesitant and going, uh, maybe one, then I'll question whether this goal is actually important to them. Is it the thing that they want? And we'll probably go through the whole cycle again, because if they've identified that it's realistic, they know how to do it, but they're not actually that invested in achieving it, maybe it's not the right goal for them. And maybe we need to approach something else. So this can be quite cyclic, but eventually you'll end up with a goal and some actions for that team, for that person, that they know how to achieve and that they feel that they can do. This kind of, um, again, goes into the themes you identified with good leadership. But because you are leading teams and you're leading people, again, doesn't mean that you know everything. So, or this is teaching with grand to suck eggs, but keep learning. Make sure that you're keeping your breadth of knowledge, make sure you're keeping up to date and learn from the people who you're guiding as well. They'll have experiences that you don't have. They might have some sources for knowledge that you don't have as well. Uh, you can learn from them as well as guiding them in return. Consider others' opinions. Easier said than done often, especially when you've experienced certain things and you go, ah, oh, I used that technology three years ago, it was awful. Things grow, things change. So it might be a case of they've got more recent experience. Go back, research it, see what their point of view is compared to what your experience was. Consider other people's opinions and weigh them up against what you've already gone through. And research your own assumptions. This is the same thing kind of again, but if you have a gut feel, if you have some knowledge, but you can't quite remember where you got it from, just double check it. Do a quick Google, do a little bit of research just to make sure that what you're saying is actually correct. Because there's that famous saying about a donkey, about when we make assumptions um, and nobody wants to be an ass. I'm saying this because I have lent on my own assumptions before and it's led to some terrible consequences. So it's just easier to listen to the people around you, just double check the things that you're saying. And remember that they're not the only people that are learning, we're all learning together at the end of the day. As a TA, in terms of learning and leadership, this comes back into the scientific method. I often have to write business cases and options for where we want to go ahead. So if it's a technical project, I will uh, normally write up something that considers the business's KPIs and how the different options uh, align into those. So whether that's increasing the amount of customers going through a particular application form, uh, increasing the speed of a process, whether it's lowering costs, your business will have some sort of KPIs which your technical projects will link into. 
So doing the options based on those. I will also explore people and operational concerns, which again is why tech and people are inherently linked. So if we use one solution, will we need to provide certain amounts of training? Uh, do we have the people available already? Does it affect future recruitments? How hard is it to recruit into that particular technology? All of these come into a technical business case. Uh, the cost, as you would expect, a lot of businesses talk purely in money. So you have to go through the different options of the different costs financially, not in terms of people. Sometimes in terms of people, if you're having to hire special skills and maintainability. So going forward with these options, are you going to be able to keep them going for 5, 10, 15 years? Is the skill set there, etc.? Um, the reason why I've put this into the leadership methods is because I've sometimes had to produce these options to show to teams as well. So I'll often try and take teams on a journey with me when deciding what architecture we want to go with. But it can also be the case that I have to kind of go off to a side and do a lot of the research myself to narrow it down to three or two that then they can decide with me on which is the best way for their team going forward. When that happens, I do tend to show them the other options that I've been looking at, what, how it aligns into business, what the costs were, what I was thinking in terms of people. Just because I find that transparency helps with building trust, but also it helps with building learning. I want my devs to become future architects. Not all of them because, you know, too many architects ruins the project. But... I would like for them to know what it involves to do this role and see what aspects of it are technical, which puts a, a paperwork. And hopefully by leading by example, they'll end up doing something similar later on too. This might be a slight personal bias because uh, I don't know that many female architects. I don't know that many architects that are not white. Um, and I didn't think this really affected me until recently when I went for the TA role. Uh, because I never met an architect who looked like me. <laughs> and I never really saw that as a boundary, but it turns out it really was. I, I went for it because somebody told me to, and I didn't think I had a chance because I hadn't seen someone who was like me. And uh, some of the architects had shown me how they work, but again, it was quite a closed off profession. So I'm hoping through leadership, through example, I can encourage more and more people into the space and let them know what technical architecture actually is and give devs experience of it before they get thrown into the role themselves. Which brings me on to my next section, which is about scaling leadership. This is all very hard to do by yourself. Uh, I currently run five teams and I'm only able to do that because I have exceptional seniors who I can delegate a lot of this to. Um, being able to do that is because I've had to learn how to lead leaders and train them how to do what I do, but also give them the room in, a, in which to learn how to do leadership, both technically and personally. So teaching leadership. Um, some of this has come up a little bit in the questions, but encouraging collaboration. So as a senior, as a lead, as a TA, and I know a lot of people aren't on this camp, but pairing, 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 pairing. And I don't just mean that in terms of code. I have my developers pairing with infrastructure engineers on some of their changes. So they have an idea of what the hell their code's running on. Um, again, with the security thing, getting them to pair with SecOps sometimes to get more of a breadth of knowledge because they're interested in it. Introducing different testing formats. So I've worked with teams who have had, I'm doing dev, draw it with a team with testers, trying to bring that testing more to the left got devs pairing with testers to learn more from them and try and change their process a little bit. It doesn't even have to be technical. Getting people to, to pair with a designer, with a BA, go crazy with it. Um, it's, I actually found this really useful as a junior. I worked in a startup very early in my career and I paired with different disciplines because in all honesty, the back of my head was going, what if I hate coding? <laughs> what have I spent like the last year training for? What am I going to do? So I was lucky enough to be in a startup where I could pair with different disciplines and go, it's fine. I can become a product owner. If I really hate this, that's what I'll do. It also builds empathy. And I think empathy is an incredibly important thing for teams. 
Um, I had a particular gentleman who liked to pretend he was doing my job all the time. And he'd give me a load of grief and he wasn't very polite. But because he was in my team, occasionally I would go, all right, I'm not doing my job today. You're doing it. And he would have to deal with all of my emails and the Slack. And within a day, he went, I'm sorry. I will be more polite in future and you can do your job because I hate it. Like, great. Thank you very much. It's daft, but it works. Um, I think empathy is incredibly important in all jobs, not just in technology roles, but it can be an incredibly helpful tool to force a bit of pairing sometimes and delegate some responsibilities. This also increases knowledge sharing. Um, this can also be rotations across teams as well. So getting a dev from one area to go into another area to get an entirely different experience of how to work in a team. It's strange how much these differ with, in one business, multiple teams can be working in different ways. But again, being able to go, you're gonna to go to that team for the months, we're gonna get them, you're gonna do some knowledge sharing, and then you're gonna go back and find out what you've learned from being in other teams, see if there's anything you can bring back and change and make better. I also think that this makes our jobs more fun because you're not stuck in the same scenario every single day, doing the same thing, occasionally get a bit of a mix up. I wouldn't necessarily say enforce because you'll get a lot of pushback if you're forcing people to pair, if you're forcing people to check out another job for a bit. Um, but encouragement, because if you've got a few people doing this, the enthusiasm tends to be infectious. They come back better developers, better testers, etc. And the people who were originally resistant tend to want to do the same because they don't want to be left behind. So encouraging collaboration, not enforcing it. Pairing through leadership. Um, this is a little bit of what I was talking to Tess about with um, if somebody wants to learn a bit about architecture or a bit, but bit about their mid and they want to do more senior like work, pairing with them through a project, let them lead it, let them drive it, but be there as a support, help doing those guiding questions, help asking about have they considered the performance, the costs, the KPIs, that kind of thing. This also works for people management. I've only seen this in two places I've worked, um, but paired people management is a really great training tool for people managers. Linking back into what I was saying before about once you get to senior, people go, hey, people management for you, that's the only way forward. That's the only way up the ladder. You really need training as a people manager. It's such an important role and it can be incredibly damaging. The lack of training has led to all of those qualities you've mentioned for bad leadership, the dictatory, the uh, insecure, the authoritarian, the closed off. They probably haven't been trained in how to do their job. So uh, I currently do paired line management. I've done it previously as well. And what this is, is uh, for new line managers, when they have a new report, we'll phase them taking over the role. So it'll start off with, I'll have a very structured format of health and well-being. Updates from them, updates from the company, any learning development. It's pretty much a five-step thing that I go through. But I will start off taking the majority of that with them observing. And then the next bit, they will take one section and I will observe and give feedback straight away. And over the course of about three months, it takes in the end. They'll be able to run by themselves, knowing how to do good coaching, how to do guiding questions. We'll have gone through how to spot spot problem areas um, and when to have conversations with people in a team for areas where they need to improve or they can improve and try and find opportunities for them. That's where sponsorship comes in as well. Being able to turn around and say, hey, my report, really eager to learn this thing. Do you have any opportunities for them to do that? I like having stabilizers. I like having a hand to hold for a little bit. So having that extra comfort blanket while you're learning these things. It's not a weakness, it's a strength to be able to admit it. So if you're finding you're not getting this at work, maybe something to bring up with them is you're pushing me into the deep end and you're not providing me with what I need. <clears throat> and learning paths. Uh, this is more for the directive type of leadership. 
Um, I've even gone as far as to make like a full on RPG learning map for somebody once, which was far too much effort for what it was worth. But I had a lot of fun with it. Uh, in that particular example, it was a fantastic new tester. She was learning more about automation and she'd gone to a conference as you do as a more junior member and gone, there's a whole world of testing. What do I want to do? Do I want to do performance? Do I want to do security? Do I want to do... And we made this tree for her for, okay, we'll focus on one. If you get into a certain depth and you find that it's not really for you, we'll go for another one. But here's an actionable learning path for what you want to learn. Uh, she was very much a workshop-based learner. So we got courses for her to do so that she could tangibly have a go at each thing. Um, and now she's a senior slash lead tester in a company and she's doing great, but she needed that very directive. This is the first thing to do. This is the next thing to do. And she wanted to see her own progress. Um, the other thing with this is to provide the spaces to practice and learn. So even if it's not directive, if you're saying lead a project, you're doing that knowing that they have the safety and experience to make mistakes. Because when we're learning, we are gonna make mistakes as part of life uh, and we can always mop up after them. So making sure that they do have an environment where they feel safe to trial things out, knowing that it's not gonna get them fired. The comment about my previous tester brings me quite nicely onto learning styles. There's a lot of different type of learning styles. Uh, some people love listening to podcasts. They can just absorb that information. Some people love reading and that's the best way to do things. Other people need to actually do something to absorb it. Most people have a combination of these. So personally, I do love reading. I love anything that has boxes and lines. If I can follow a flow chart, I can take it in quite well. But if I really want to remember it, I have to try and do it and then talk about it or teach someone else about it to actually retain the information and be able to hold it for future things. So I'm a bit of a mix between a visual learner and a kinesthetic learner, but put me on a podcast and ask me questions an hour later, I won't have a clue, I'm afraid. The thing is with the learning styles is people might not be able to identify which learning style is best for them. Um, and that might be because they've had leadership who've gone, I've learned things from reading blogs. Here are some blogs to teach you how to do this thing. And they've never actually explored whether that's right for them or not. Uh, the amount of students in particular in the past who've just thought they were stupid because they couldn't retain stuff and it turned out it was just been given to them in the wrong format. And actually the learning uh, that we're offering to them just needed to be adapted so that they could absorb it. You'd be amazed how many there are. And this is for your teams as well. You're going to have different types of learner in your teams, uh, for want of a better word. What I tend to do with all of my technical teams is get them to share how they like to learn things so that we can find compatible ways for them to share knowledge within the teams. Because it might not necessarily always be documentation. It might be that they need a demonstration as well internally in that team. It might be that there's a need for a certain person to pair in order to take in that knowledge. And that's fine as long as we're aware of it. As I say, these are all themes and they're not defined into boxes. So just because somebody learns from a blog once doesn't mean that's gonna be the best way for them for all contexts. Um, and this is incredibly hard as a leader to try and gauge both technically and personally. So you'll probably have to have this repeat conversation numerous times, given that it's different things that you're teaching them. So uh, test-driven development, for example, somebody might, find a plural site course is great. Another person might want to do test-driven development in practice, all good. But then you talk to them about uh, infrastructure changes. It might be they learn that in a completely different way. So try to keep those communication lines open so that they can tell you what's the best way for them to learn uh, and trying to find resources that help with that. I actually struggle with the latter. If, it's, um, if I have somebody who learns from listening, I am terrible at recommending podcasts because I don't listen to them. They'll often have to lean on someone else who learns in that way. Uh, but that's okay because can't be good at everything. Which brings me nicely onto communication. 
So yeah, uh, helping others find their way while providing a safe space for failure, super important for all forms of leadership. <laughs> Probably not the example to use, but I find I've learned the most from the incidents I've caused. Um, never say that in an interview. <laughs> I find if I've broken something, I will never break it in that same way again. I will learn everything about that thing, how I've caused that breakage, how the hell it happened. I will offer to run the RCA. And that is as a dev, that's as a TA, I still make mistakes now. Um, but I know I do this knowing that with the failure, I've learned from it, but I'm never going to be punished. I'm never going to be blamed. And I try to encourage that culture in all of my technical teams. It's okay to fail if you're breaking production. We will fix it very quickly. We will do the root cause analysis to find out how we got there. But it's never a person that breaks production. It's a process. It's because it's got through PRs when it shouldn't have. Why didn't it get caught? It's because a test didn't manage to catch that thing. It's because of something process-wise that we've missed. It's never a specific person. And likewise with a project. If they start off doing the rough math and go, hey, this is going to save us 50%. And then actually when it goes into an environment, it costs us a load more money. Fine, we'll catch that early and we'll make sure we don't get a massive AWS bill. But as long as we take the learnings from that, it's all good. No harm, no foul. Nobody's died. We're all fine. Um, this is really, really hard to embed into Teams. I... <laughs> I had one developer who I just could not get this through to, who every time they made a mistake, they said, I had to get the blame because you always give me the praise when I do well. It's like, yes, I give you praise because you've done well. <laughs> but when you've done things wrong, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily you that's the problem. So but getting that through was quite difficult. And it ended up um, actually an intervention with the team, uh, which probably isn't the best way, where the team are going, Look, you being so uncomfortable about failing is making all of us uncomfortable about what we're doing. This is the way we see it. We never blame you for your for whatever's broken. We blame all of us because some one of us has missed something in the process, like each and every one of us. There's been four of us do a PR. So each of us missed it. How can we expect you to find it? It's really, really difficult creating safe spaces but I think safe spaces are essential for good leadership. Uh, in terms of finding their own way as well, that can also be really hard because sometimes you see this like slow motion train crash, you know they're going in the wrong direction. Sometimes you just gotta let them do it because they'll learn more from that train crashing than from you changing their direction altogether. <laughs> Something I do a little bit too well, uh, candor, honesty, and actionable feedback. Be honest, uh, one of the negative things that came up quite a few times on your word bubble, politics. Oh, I hate politics. I mean, sometimes you have to play the game, but in general, honesty is the best policy. Say why things are being done, Just be transparent about it. It's nothing personal, it's mostly business. But if you're being honest and people know where they stand, you'll gain more trust and people will look to you more as a leader and hopefully they think that you're guiding them in the right direction. As well with that, they'll feel free to be honest to you too. So they will give feedback in return for your honesty. If they think you're going in the wrong direction, from my experience, the people you're honest with will be honest back and say, hey, maybe that's not the best idea in the world. And you can have that conversation. Candor also comes into that. Um, there is a great book called Radical Candor. I think they have a podcast too, uh, but highly recommend it. And that's in terms of making sure that you're not being overly empathetic, make sure that you're not being overly harsh, but whenever you're giving your feedback, be objective, make sure that it's in a format where they can take actions away from it and not feel that you're personally uh, getting at them. But likewise, don't be so nice that they're never going to be able to improve. Uh, there is a really good quadrant graph, which I normally keep on my desk, but isn't here right now. Uh, and I like to gauge where I am on that occasionally with having conversations with people. And in terms of actionable feedback, don't give feedback that people can't do anything about. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's painful and it hurts people. So 
even if you have to step away and think about it first and get back to them in relatively quick time, but maybe not do it while you're emotionally driven. If you need to give feedback on how they've delivered a message, a technical direction they're taking right now, make sure it's done in a way that you can explain the impacts of what their actions are and suggestions for how they could approach it differently in future or how they might approach it differently going forward. And again, in a way that isn't you telling them what to do, but hopefully they can go, yes, you're quite correct, or they might disagree and that's fine too. But as long as you're giving them some way in which to improve on that thing that you've noticed, that's always good. Examples of that not working, I've had a people manager who just said I was abrasive and I went, okay, can you give me an example of a conversation where I was abrasive? And they just went, no. So I had no idea what behaviors I actually needed to change. I just knew that somebody didn't like me, <laughs> which really isn't very helpful. Whereas if they turn around and I'm trying not to swear here, but if they turn around going, hey, you're being a bit of a, do you mind not doing that? Because I, I, I take blunt feedback in that way. I go, oh, okay, well, can you tell me what I've done wrong? And I will try and change your behavior. And I've got no problem with that. But not being able to ha have an example makes it near impossible to change or improve on whatever I've done to offend. Hopefully I haven't offended you in this talk. So this kind of brings us in, but talk to others, ask for honest feedback, be open to criticism. Really, really hard to get criticism from anyone, especially on technical stuff for some reason. Um, but hopefully opening different, by giving criticism, hopefully you'll also uh, encourage people to give you criticism. Make sure that you're very, being very open in terms of your lack of knowledge in the area as well. Um, I'm, <laughs> I talk to others often because I don't have the experience they do, so I will lean on them. Uh, I am very good in certain things, but I will hold my hands up and say, when it comes to database architecture, I don't have the most experience. I'm not the best at it. So I will tend to lean on other people. And I will be very open about those conversations to everyone I'm working with. So again, they feel safe to go, I don't know this thing, can I learn about it? And reach out to me if they need to, or I can help them find other people. Because being human, being flawed, it's an okay to thing to be honest about. Um, and this can go even to a personal level. As a technical leader, I'm running a number of different projects at the moment. It's very intense. It's quite high pressured, uh, but I've had to take a bit of time doing less because, and I'm going to be way too candid here, sorry. Um, I'm currently going through a situation where both a friend and a family member have had terminal cancer diagnosis. And this is horrible and it's horrific to go through, but it's not just personal because it affects my work as well. I knew for a good couple of weeks, I was going to be slightly distracted. I'd probably make a few more mistakes and I'd be working a bit slower. So I turned around to my teams. I said, look, this is a situation. It's okay. Like I'm dealing with it, but be easy on me for a while. Uh, and don't expect things quite as quickly as you normally get them. And they've been amazing. They've been astoundingly great. Um, but I also have that in my teams in general they they will cut turn around and go I'm not going to do so great this week I really want to learn this thing but I'm not here because xyz so maybe we can postpone this pairing session or maybe we can do this project a bit later and then I'll talk to product and delivery and see what we can do but it's okay not to be this ivory tower perfect person who knows everything in fact I think it's better not to be that person uh, I think it's best to be human feedback loops uh, this is the biggest problem as you go up the tree, I find. Um, when I was a developer, I would write some code. Something would happen. Sometimes it would break. Sometimes it wouldn't. And I'd go, hey, I did a thing. And that was great. That was in an hour. In a worst case scenario, probably a few hours, especially if I was fixing a bug. But the feedback loop was really, really quick. And I, I really did not take that uh but i took it for granted that i had within an hour i was like yeah i'm awesome i did this thing or occasionally had to sleep this night or i have a terrible developer and i can't figure this out but by the next day i probably had 
great feedback loops. When you get into leadership and technical architecture, those feedback loops aren't as fast and they aren't as obvious. Um, and when I first went into these roles, I found this really, really hard as a leader because your uh, feedback doesn't come from you anymore. It comes from the teams around you, their projects, the people around you and how they're doing. And that's really, really difficult to keep track of. Uh, and even harder to take credit for personally. I, I love it when somebody's turned around and gone, I've done this thing and I've been teaching them for a few months and they finally get it and a penny's dropped. That's a very obvious piece of feedback that I've done well as a leader. They've managed to do something. Or um, outside of work, somebody doing their very first talk or doing a first conference talk. Oh, it makes me feel amazing. Like the world is just the best place in the universe, which probably is. When you're leading teams and they're doing projects, there's going to be a lot of times where it feels like they're going backwards. Uh, you're not really going to see your impacts. And that can be really, really hard to get through. So find ways to acknowledge your impacts. This goes back to that coaching. If you've got a good coach, they're going to help you find your goals and your actual items. And the feedback loop might be months. In some cases, it might be years if you're really unfortunate. But with a good coach or with a good leader, they'll help you acknowledge your wins. I have a yay list at work. Uh, it has a list of projects I'm doing. It has a list of people I'm looking after. And it's got a list of things I'm learning. And each time I do something that goes towards that, I give myself a little tick because I am a toddler who needs gold stars to achieve anything, it turns out. But it's also really helped me with my quarterly reviews and my yearly reviews because where my manager's gone, hey, why are we paying you all this money? I can bring up my yay list and go look at all the things I've done. Whereas if it was, uh, if I didn't do that, I'd probably sit there going, I've got no clue why you're paying me anything. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what impact I've had. That person's angry at me and I don't know why that project's failing. Uh, it's very easy to focus on the negatives, um, very hard to focus on the positives. So as a leader, take care of yourself, make sure you're tracking the things that you're winning. Uh, an important bit of acknowledging process is also acknowledging endings. Uh, this comes from developers, this comes for tech arcs, it comes for leads, it comes for everything. If you finish a project, celebrate it. If you've managed to push a piece of code out to a user and it's affected them, celebrate it. I, we seem to be on this treadmill of sprints, especially in a very agile environment where it's work after work after work after work. And I find that people don't take the time to celebrate the things they're achieving. Us delivering value is an achievement and sometimes you know, you need to buy a pizza, have some cake, play among us with your teammates, do whatever it is that makes you happy to say, yes, I did something today and it was awesome. Common errors, and I'm trying not to be too luxury here. Uh, this is just mistakes I've made in the past that I won't do again, hopefully. But you can't do everything for yourself. Uh, in these roles, heroes cause harm. Uh, I often call heroes crutches because as soon as they disappear, everything falls over. I've tried to be that person who's done all the projects, done all the costing, tried to implement everything, not really delegated at all. And then I go on holiday for two weeks and everything's on fire. Or somebody has been in that role in a workplace I've worked and they've left and all that knowledge has gone with them. And we're having to relearn an entire system because they pretty much wrote it solo. At the time, they'll probably thought, hey, that guy's a hero. He's working. 24 seven, trying to make sure that the lights stay on. But realistically, he's not really saving anyone or she isn't. Um, so also this can also cause a hell of a lot of burnout. Burnout is not fun, which is why I've talked about teaching leadership. Um, and you've probably noticed a lot of what I've said is about delegating, teaching other people to lead things, making sure that other people know how to do your job if you're not there making sure that they're communicating with each other and teaching each other so that it's a continuous cycle. So that if you're gone, the world doesn't end. Might go a bit slower if you're lucky, so then they miss you. 
but it won't end. Being a hero doesn't help anyone. People don't fit in boxes. Uh, <laughs> we're really bad at putting people in boxes with labels um, and thinking they're going to fit to a stereotype. They don't. So again, with learning styles, uh, with approaching projects, try to adapt to the teams you're working with, the people you're working with, and even the context of the problem space. I'm going to apply this quickly to tech now because I'm sure we've all seen it where somebody's learned something and they start using it as a hammer that's going to fix everything. Where, let's face it, it's not going to. Um, so also adapt your tech to the context of your problem. Just because Mongo was good for that one thing doesn't mean you should use it everywhere. I'm not bitter about that particular project, but I am. Um, so people don't fix and fit into boxes, neither do technologies. It's okay to admit when you can't do something. I've done it on this call. I suck at database architecture. It's something I am trying to learn. Uh, and it's okay to find someone who can. And it might not even be for my situation. It might not be a fellow tech arc. It might be a mid-level dev who's got more experience in that thing. And that's cool. I'm glad that there's people with more experience around me. I will lean on that. I don't care what job title they have. If I can learn from them, I will learn from them. If it means that they can learn how to drive something a bit further and go outside their role a bit, even better. I like to use the word admit here because I will be very open about this on calls as well. So if I've turned around to someone and asked for their help, I'll go to their stand up and say, I'm sorry, I've taken up this person's time because I'm struggling with this thing and they're helping me with it. I hope that's okay. Because it's also just giving that bit of credit, like don't make it out that you know everything. If you are getting help from someone, make them feel appreciated for it because they're taking time out of their day to help you. I know I've already said this, but it's really, really, really important. You're not a therapist. Uh, if you do genuinely think that somebody needs help, and this is part of the openness as well. So if you have got that open, safe to fail culture in your teams and someone's going, I'm struggling with work because this stuff's going on outside in my home life, you're not there to fix it, but you can point them into directions where they can get help. Um, it's really hard not to get invested in the people who you're working with. Totally understand that because you're spending so much of your life with them. But make sure that they're getting the appropriate help and that you're not trying to fill that role for them. And keep your passion. Oh, this is a challenge sometimes. Make time for your own learning. <laughs> make time for your own learning. I'm going to say this like six times if I have to. Make time for your own learning. The problem is especially again, when you get to senior, when you get to tech art, even when you're in a mid or junior role and you're really trying to prove yourself. So you're just working, 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 working. You'll lose your love for tech. Um, I've certainly done it before where I've just ended up on the treadmill of doing stuff that, yeah, it pays the bills and I kind of care about it, but I don't feel like I've learned anything for a while. And personally, that really gets me down. So make time to identify the areas where you want to learn, find something that you think is great and learn about it, whether it's in your field or not. I actually don't mind. But keeping your passion in technology is really difficult. And I found it particularly difficult during this whole lockdown COVID situation because normally I'd go to a conference and I'd meet some smart people and I'd see something I'd never heard about before and that would reignite that. But without that kind of thing going on at the minute, Sometimes you have to push yourself to do it. So make time for your own learning and development, uh, whether that's technical, people management, otherwise, super, super important. And as I say, and I've said this many times, but it is really, really important. Acknowledge your impacts and celebrate them. And that's your teams too. If they've learned a new technology, the celebration can be a sharing of knowledge. It can be, we have done our tests in Cyprus rather than Selenium. And we did it for these reasons. And we're gonna go and share it with the rest of our tech community to show, yay, we've done this thing, we've achieved it, but hey, this is how you can do it too. That's still a celebration. Um, and it's a great celebration because you're sharing the joy. Cyprus is a joy. And this is probably kind of the key line to this whole thing, but 
passion is really infectious and it's a great leadership tool. So if you're taking the time to do your own learning and finding out about things that you're genuinely interested in in tech or in people management or whatever your field is within this industry, and if you're being open about that, if you're really getting passionate about teaching other people and getting them involved in projects, if you're shouting out and going, hey, this stuff you're doing is amazing, <laughs> even if you're turning around and occasionally going, yeah, we could have done better, but oh, well, whoops, this is how we're going to correct it. Being that kind of, and I'm saying this as quite an introverted person who's a loud mouth when she's speaking, but showing the passion for our industry, for the work we're doing, for the people we're working with and the teams and how they're progressing and achieving. Personally, I find that's the greatest leadership tool of all um, because you're putting the faith into the people rather than trying to tell them what to do. There is a lot of resources here. As I said, I do a lot of research around this stuff and I just threw some things I found helpful. So there is a couple of pages of different books, different links. Um, if you do want to find out any more about different styles, or even if you have a different learning type that's not on here <laughs> that I can help you with, uh, please do get in touch on Twitter or uh, I'll share my details with Jason as well if you prefer email or anything else. Um, I'm always eager to talk about these things. And I apologize that this wasn't a very technical talk, but I hope that you will gain something from it anyway. And I'm hoping for lots of Q&A. So thank you. The way that I've done this currently, and I'm not certainly necessarily saying it's the right way, is I'm offering the opportunity for them to take turns in leading projects with in mind that I'm keeping an eye on them at the same time. So go pair with me. We'll go through what I do in my role together. I'll let you lead a lot of it, but I'll just tell you what you need to do as an architect. And for this project going forward, we normally split our projects into epics, very scrum. For this piece of work, you're going to be the lead on it. You're going to do my job. And as part of that, you're going to have to get the team's buy-in and make sure that the team's going along with you. Knowing that each of them are going to get their turn, normally that does the trick <laughs> um, because it has a bit of a two-way attack on this. A, they get the power and they're very happy with that. I'm happy with that because I get to share some of the workload. Um, and train them a bit, which I do enjoy doing. The other thing is all the others know it's going to be their turn and eventually. So they tend to behave and not cause too much problems for the person who's leading that particular project. <laughs> you do get some personalities that don't work with that um, and you'd have to have a word with them. Um, I would suggest if you're having a word with them, have another person in the room as a facilitator and make sure it's a very objective conversation of look this is how you are affecting me in my role this is how I'd like us to work together but these are the impacts you're having because this can be quite emotionally tied always have a facilitator once they've got a taste this is why you need to be with them while they're starting to do this and say look we're going to do it as a pair because you're they will realize, hopefully, as soon as they start to get out of the depth, they'll start to panic, they'll start to make mistakes. And that's when you're there to go, look, this is why I'm here. I can help by taking over this, this, and this. What we can do now, though, is have a word with people manager. We now know the areas in which you need to improve. So let's try and find opportunities for you to learn in those spaces. Um, and I'm saying that because that's what someone did to me, is they threw me out of my depths and I went, I know nothing about security. Oh my God. Um, and then they went, okay, we'll have a wedding people manager. People manager made, uh, managed to get me a day a week working with the security teams and learning more about their area, which then strengthened me enough that I do a lot of security work now as an architect. Turns out I love it. But I wouldn't have been able to identify that without having the opportunity to fail first. I would like my devs to have the option, know that there's the option to be an architect. So I have a little problem with technology <laughs> in that most of the places I've worked, uh, once you've got to senior, people start pushing you into management. 
and becoming a line manager and a people manager. And because just because you're good at tech doesn't necessarily mean that you are good at or will enjoy people management. Just one of these things, which I find is a bit of a blocker in terms of progression. I know some great seniors who will remain seniors forever because they love the code. And I truly respect that. Um, but I also know that they're probably going to end up contracting because the money isn't there permanently. You, you don't get much promotion after you hit a certain point as a senior. I like technical architecture because it still gives me the option of remaining technical. I have to do a lot of people stuff still, um, particularly with stakeholder management and that kind of thing. But I get to do infrastructure. I get to help with code occasionally when I'm allowed. I get to do a, a bit of proof of concepting. So I get to still do what I've been training in for so many years without having to leave it all behind. Um, and I think that that route isn't as visible as it should be for a lot of people. Unfortunately, if you have the wrong type of manager or leader, it can be pushed for their own agenda in some cases, which isn't great, which is why having your goals set early is quite important for this. So for example, um, some of my stuff will be either technical or delivery related. It might be, I want to improve delivery times for teams by doing, and then my smart goals will be something like uh, making their, teaching devs how to do more automated testing, improving test coverage, um, putting in alerting for their systems, that kind of thing, which is very uh, measurable actions that I can take which is fine in terms of this is what I'm doing for my manager. But on the personal note of seeing that affect the teams, I can't be judged for that for my job, but it is something that I will judge myself for. Um, I want to have positive impacts on the people around me. So sometimes I will have a few weeks where I've been doing some stuff, but I'm not actually seeing the results of it. And it's seeing the results of it that can be really difficult to wait for sometimes. <laughs> Maybe I'm impatient, I don't know. <laughs> um, depends very much on who's leading you. Uh, if I was your leader, I'd just like you to tell me. So um, ask for, I'm gonna put it myself in the situation and then I'm gonna say for a few different types of leaders. But if I was your leader in any position, I'd request that you, either send me some written feedback or just request a 30 minute call. I tend to prefer conversations, um, but that's because I think writing can be interpreted in different ways. And I wanna make sure that I'm getting the right point of view from you. Then, you know, give me a heads up that it's about how, about your learning styles um, and then have that conversation. Go, look, if you're unsure about it, say, I would like to try a few different things if that's okay with you. Can you give me any advice for where to find a podcast, a workshop, whatever you want to try. And explain that is because you might be struggling a little bit with the format you're currently getting that information in. They should be fine with that. It might be that your leader's a little bit less comfortable because they haven't had any training in being a coach or being a mentor or otherwise, or being people manager. So still have that conversation, but you can, you can openly say to them, if you're uncomfortable giving me guidance on how we should be learning, is there someone else I can talk to? And hopefully they'll be okay with that. If they're still not okay with that, find a coach or mentor outside of work. That's okay too. Uh, I have a coach outside of work. They're great. And actually it helps me because they're not bogged down by the context of the work I'm doing. They just help me with my learning style and my direction. Um, and I, if you want to find out how to find a coach, get in touch with me outside of this and I'll try and point you in the right direction. Um, three most important actions. Mm. Good question. Uh, I'd say one of them, and I, it's because I've repeated it several times, is the keeping your passion. Make sure you're doing something that you enjoy. Uh, whether it is in your own learning or whether it's with the teams, make sure that you're doing something you enjoy and you're acknowledging it. Yes, I was naughty. I mixed two into one. Ah, well. Um, the other thing is to 
not be a dictator or an ivory tower, share knowledge in a way that helps other people grow. Um, and the third one actually isn't in my talk. Uh, I'd say try not to take everything personally. Um, I've mentioned a lot that we make mistakes, uh, things happen. Unfortunately, as a leader, sometimes those effects, the effects of those mistakes can be slightly more catastrophic than usual, either on your system or on the people around you. But you are only human. So try not to beat yourself up too much for anything that you do wrong. If you're trying to create a, a culture of safety, then if you're allowing other people to make mistakes, you've got to allow yourself to make mistakes too and not kill yourself over it. Um, easier said than done. I rely a little bit on my delivery and product managers for that too. So a lot of the work that I'm delegating, I will make very clear to the delivery or product manager that I'm thinking of getting this person to do a little bit more work in order so that A, they can prioritize at work, but B, they can lighten the load on that particular individual. So they might have a lighter sprint mm -hmm. the next time around just to make sure there's room for it. Um, the other thing is I would keep checking in with them to make sure that they're not completely driving themselves into the ground to try and achieve this thing. Most importantly, I learned how to say no. That's been a real learning curve for me just this year is um, I've got a lot of projects on, but uh, in the last couple of weeks, I've prioritized down to what are the most impactful, what do I want to concentrate on? And I've said to the stakeholders, the other ones, I'm going to put these in the back burner. They're not, nothing's going to happen with them for a while. I'll update you when I have capacity but this is why I can't do it. And saying no is an incredibly powerful thing. Really, really good question. And uh, for a bit of context on this, the teams that I was a lead developer for, I am now a TA for. So I've had to go through this distinction very um, in quite a stressful format. Uh, the main distinction between senior and lead in particular is as a lead, I hardly coded. I was not an individual contributor anymore. Um, what my job was, was more around uh, best practice guidance, making sure that the teams were working with delivery appropriately, um, giving them access to the right technologies, having conversations with infrastructure teams to, it's a lot of unblocking teams. Um, it's quite a people managing kind of role to a degree, being a lead dev because all the, you will be doing some people management, but although not your whole job is one-to-one, -one, it's almost like you're managing that whole team's health, but not in the same way a delivery manager would because it is more technically based and you're helping guide them in more modern practices and doing the best they can be. Uh, technical architecture. I mean, for full transparency, I'm kind of doing both roles at once at the moment because they've got a gap where the lead was. Uh, I haven't been replaced. So I'm currently doing both roles at once. But with technical architecture, uh, it's a lot more project-based. Uh, I have to do a lot more uh, conversations with stakeholders and it's around those business cases. So where do we want to go strategically long-term in terms of tech? Uh, what do we want to do in terms of stability, security, how, cost? What are the trade-offs with that? How are we making those decisions? So it's very much less in the code and more um, long-term strategic vision. The difference between interviews is senior developer, as you already know, you'll tend to have a tech test as well as some questions. There will be some coding element involved. Lead developer, um, when I was interviewed, I did a few interviews for that. Um, all of that was around how to gauge where the team were, how you do things like leadership. So getting buy-in for wanting them to do best practices, uh, how to identify problem areas, how to solve them. So slightly more strategic. And then technical architecture uh, was more technical in all honesty. I had to, um, for example, they gave me an ex example of a system and I had to give a six months plan on how to improve that working with teams, working with stakeholders, and what technologies I might look at using, where I thought the biggest risks were, that kind of thing. Hmm. Okay. 
Um, serious answer, and I hate to bring gender into this, but I'm always surrounded by those freaking people who think they're better than me. Um, whether it be for many of my qualities, I am quite young for what I do, but well, I look younger than I am. Um, I am female. I am not white. Like there's a lot of reasons people can pick on me, but, um, I'm a rebellious sort. I tend to prove myself through my actions. So if I'm working with another leader, often I don't have to work with them anyway, but I will uh, go very much to scientific methods of doing what I deem is best for me and my teams. I will protect my teams against anything that I think is disadvantageous to them. And if the person's going, well, you're always wrong, I'll show the evidence of all the things that is caused are right, which is also a good reason for tracking your yays and your things that you've done well at is because they can't fight against evidence going, this is how much I've improved delivery this is how much uh, how much more secure our systems are compared to yours without being a bit too braggy. But they can't fight against that as much as they might not like me personally and think they're the best. Um, so I've, I've worked in a couple of places that have done that. And previously I've tried to push it from a TA perspective, from a senior perspective. Luckily it's a lot easier now as a technical architect. But um, where I wrote about business cases earlier, I've had to do that for languages. So go, your estate is currently this many languages. You're having problems onboarding people, hiring people, et cetera. So doing a business case for the languages, saying which is easiest to train in, what's being taught in boot camps, universities, et cetera, what has the best support libraries. And I'll go and research into these languages and those kind of aspects of it. Uh, then turn around to the business stakeholders as well as the technical stakeholders and say, this is the current state we're in. And these are the top two languages I think we should be aiming for. This is why. And how you get there, that's the difficult bit, is trying to explain the plan for how you get from 10 languages to two, um, which if ever you're interested in, I can help with that. I've had to do this a few times now. It's always going to be a lengthy process, but it's going back to speaking the same language that the business speaks and saying, look, if you carry on the way that you're doing, we're going to have unmaintainable systems. You're not going to be able to hire anyone. And it's going to cost a fortune to get a single person to work on one of these systems. 